Hello everybody and welcome to another Game Theory video. So, I haven't made one of these in a little while, but I wanted to make one as a prompt, sort of as a response to my own topic of the week. Um, but I wanted to talk about allegiance abilities and re reintroduce the concept of linear versus modular design because I think the Firestorm uh, allegiance abilities that prompted the top of the, week, of the week also play into this concept very strongly. And... Uh, this is going to be some fairly inside baseball stuff, so fair warning. Uh, but this is a thing that I feel pretty strongly about when it comes to design of games like this that are meant to be played competitively, and especially where you have a large pool of items to draw from, i.e. you're not playing chess where the pieces are set and the sides are set, but instead you are effectively creating your own force out of a vast array of choices and options. Um, then I believe that you need to have a discussion about linear versus modular design. So that's what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to frame it within these sort of allegiance abilities. So with that being said as a setup, let's uh, get into it. All right, so first, what is linear versus modular design? I feel like we should probably begin by defining our terms. So linear design is very simple. It says, if I choose A... And when I'm sitting down to build something, I'm going to play this army, this deck in magic, whatever. If I choose A, then I am heavily incentivized to choose B. And if I choose A and B, then I am even more heavily incentivized to choose C and so on. To the point where a vast majority of my choices end up getting made for me. It's climbing a ladder. Uh, the classic example of this in magic is things like tribal. So this is a magic card. And... You can see here the ability other centaur creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and have vigilance and trample. Now, what's notable here is two important things. The words other and centaur. So he doesn't buff himself, right? He, he doesn't give himself that ability. And centaur, a type of creature. So if this guy is the only centaur creature in your deck, if this is it then half of his card might as well say bleep bleep bloop bishmoobity shmop. It says nothing. It's blank text, right? So any common sense person who reads that is going to respond naturally to the incentive and begin including other centaurs, perhaps other synergies with other things that buff other centaurs, okay? Um, other lord type characters or synergistic uh, behaviors or things like that that are going to help your centaur strategy be successful. Um, this is one of my favorite examples because I think centaurs are just such a funny thing to build a tribe around. So, but there you go. So I hope that's fairly obvious as to what linear is, right? In other words, by including and making this choice that this guy is going to be in the deck, and, and often, by the way, this choice is made at sort of a meta level. I want to build a centaur deck or something like that. At a granular level, once I've made the choice to include one of these things, it sort of informs my next choice. Okay. <clears throat> Modular design, on the other hand, says if I choose A, I have not changed my incentive for the next choice in any meaningful way. So a classic example of this would be a card like Lightning Bolt. Um, Lightning Bolt's a great card. It is a great utility card in red. It was a staple in, you know, Red Sly and Red Burn for a long, 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 long time. Those decks had many different forms, completely different card sets, but it often had Lightning Bolt. But it was also a staple in other types of decks. Um, it's just an incredibly efficient card. One red, three damage to one target. Like creature, later, you know, clarified to say creature or player. Um, but the point being is that it doesn't, in any meaningful way, other than maybe I need to have some red mana in there, but let's, I'm going to, I don't want to get down to that granularity. Um, it doesn't in any way inform my next choice. I could have a almost completely creature-based attack deck, but want to include a couple lightning bolts because it gives me an interesting ability to remove threats that I need to get out of the way. I could have an all red burn deck, and this is my answer, you know, this is one of my most potent sort of cheap damage shots. I could have a control-based deck where I'm spending most of my time countering spells or stuff like that, but this is my quick, easy, cheap answer to little things that squeak through that of my control that might cause me a problem. Okay, like I can stop the big stuff, but occasionally little things will get through and little things can still cause problems in magic. So that's modular design. 
All right. So in broad terms, as we think about this, Linear says the sum of the parts, the whole, basically, is greater than the sum of all those parts, right? Because as I put all the parts together, the intra-game uh, element synergies make something more meaningful, more powerful, uh, beyond the curve of what they would otherwise be alone. Modular design says... I am going to have something that is exactly the sum of its parts, okay? And the sum of those parts, and I'm going to utilize the best parts. Modular design, you're attempting to build a sort of Frankenstein's monster where you take the best of everything and make it into a powerful single thing. It's not greater than the sum of its parts. It is the sum of its extremely powerful parts, it's Serpentor, whereas Linear Design is, I suppose, I don't know. I don't have a good 80s cartoon reference for Linear Design. Oh, duh, okay. Linear Design is the Constructicons. There you go. If you take one Constructicon, you probably want to get the other four to make Devastator. Ah, ha, ha. I got there. All right. So let's, let's move on past 80s nostalgia and magic and talk about Warhammer. So one of the reasons that I think it's important to have both of these things in your design, in your overall game, is because I think that you want to you want to create a healthy meta. So let me explain what I mean there. I don't mean how we normally use meta in terms of Warhammer, like the tournament scene. I mean meta in the larger sense of the games that everyone is playing at all of their tables around the world, whether at a tournament or in a basement or garage or a game store or whatever. Okay? Good design favors designing at 45 degrees. The green line. Now, these are all zones. Okay? Like, I have a little zone set up here. The uh, x-axis being, you know, modular. The y being designer. Flip that around. I don't remember. I didn't label it. Now I don't remember. The point being is that... If you drift too far on either side, you get into a danger zone. We'll talk about that. But it's not as though you're aiming for some golden mean either. You're aiming for a broad zone in the middle. Okay? Why? Why am I saying good design favors designing at 45 degrees? And what the heck does that even mean? It means you need to have elements of both. And we'll see that in the next slide. But when there are equal incentives spread across your game to do both of these things, players will naturally do both of these things, depending on the incentives that they follow. And that will encourage the maximum amount of viable builds, because your rules support building in both ways. Hence, the lists or the decks or the whatever function in both ways viably. I don't, it doesn't, I don't want to get into the, the nuance of like tier, whatever, blah, 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 quality tournament winning. That's all nonsense. I don't care about any of that. That's largely a flukes of time and small things and player skill and a hundred other uh, sort of factors that are very hard to nail down. What I mean is in the general sense, this is a viable list. Okay. You have a chance to win when you sit down at the table against most other armies. Um, it suits more player types simultaneously because some players naturally favor certain types of armies or lists or decks or whatever. For example, um, you know, Johnny traditionally really likes, uh, or sorry, uh, Johnny tends to fall in the middle. Um, Timmy tends to very much like linear things like tribal decks. Uh, Spike tends to love modular things because he likes overpowered, individual, efficient things. So... These individual, the more you're in the middle, the more all the players get what they want because there are viable options on both sides. Okay? Now, if you lean too much into the danger zone here, if you end up having too many game elements that weight the incentive structure to being too linear or too modular, then you get a couple very serious game destructive problems. And by the way, neither of these are imbalance because I've got a whole separate video coming 
where I'm going to talk a deep dive on Valens. It's been a discussion point lately, and I've got a bug about it. I'm finally going to make a video I've wanted to make for about two years. But the danger we get here is actually far more game destroying than imbalance. And that is in the case of linear design, when design becomes too linear, lists build themselves. And what I mean by that is they become building your pieces on your side of the chessboard. There's no decision points there. I just set out my pawns and my rooks and my knights and my bishops and so on. Okay. That's it. That's all I do. Where, uh, and, and it's the same thing when design waits linearly too much. I take whatever the next thing is that is the most obvious synergistic next step with my previous choice. That's it. There's no cleverness to it. There's no creativity to it. Johnny tends to suffer because things aren't, there's no creativity to list building, no nuance to it, right? Um, Spike suffers because he can't find anything he actually wants to play. And in the end, it's even bad for Timmy, who likes these types of decks. But he still wants to be creative in the way he puts it together. He doesn't want the game to play for him. So when it becomes super obvious, for example, if you had 10 units, and every one of them got hyper-powerful when they were with those exact 10 units, you know, and like there was a thing that was printed on there that said, if this unit is with at least nine of these other units, it gets all of this amazing stuff. And all 10 of these units all said that to the point where you would just build your whole army in that one thing and that one thing alone, and it would be far beyond the pale of all other strategies, then that becomes the obvious choice. That's dangerous. The problem with going too modular is exactly the opposite. Again, the number of lists restricts. You would think when there's no synergistic uh, sort of incentive to go uh, with, with you know the next thing that you actually get a huge number of lists. If you've ever played an MMO where you have extremely varied skill choices, you know that this is false. Um, because what ends up happening is a very easy to suss out best of. It's your, when, when, when all the incentives tilt toward the modular side, it becomes very easy to just hunt and peck out the best of options. Okay, You find the most efficient choices at every point in time, and you pick those. And that's it. Okay, And then there becomes default lists. In this particular alliance color deck, whatever, I don't care, um, you these are the choices you make, period. Because they are the most efficient things and there is nothing that can counter them. So I hope you see how the extremes here are dangerous and lead to bad games, <laughs> okay? It's good to have some internal synergy that pushes people toward linear design and it's good to have some modularity that allows freedom and openness and choice. Both things need to be present. When you're in the green zone in the middle, that's where you have this tension. And the tension is good. Okay, You should have something pulling you in both directions. You should want to take the best of unit, but if you do, it destroys your allegiance or whatever. Because now you have to make a real choice in list building. That's actually rewarding real choices equal real rewards fake choices don't just reading what is the mathematically proven best of thing and then putting it into a list is not making a choice just taking the next thing that is the thing the the that game element in front of you tells you to take i took a this a told me to took b so i took b not making a choice okay Real choices yield real psychological benefits. So let's plot some design. And by the way, this isn't even close to exhaustive. Like there's so much more, there's so many more things we could plot on here, but I just wanted to give an example. In the linear side, and, and I wanna talk about it oftentimes with things like allegiance command abilities. Um, on the linear side, you have things like the most obvious and the closest to the line being faction synergy abilities. Um, what I mean by this is uh, an ability printed on a unit that says, all green skins get this. 
or a command ability that says choose a single dispossessed unit or a, you know whatever or all iron jaws units within uh the the maw crusher or the sorry the mega boss on maw crusher ability is like one of the most linear abilities i've ever seen because not only does it require iron jaws units it also requires lots of iron jaws units right it's, so you roll a die and you compare it to the number of iron jaws units around you well then obviously i'm incentivized to surround myself with lots of iron jaws units who are also by the by quite expensive meaning i'm probably burning my whole army on that single faction in other words it's making a lot of my choices for me maybe not specifically but generically but they push me into a more linear build. Um, faction allegiance abilities are, again, another linear type of build. So, you know, these are the just standard allegiance abilities, whether it's your Host of Slaanesh or your Brayherd or your Wanderers or your Stormcast or whatever. You know, you get an allegiance ability when you are in allegiance, when all of your units, minus your allies, we'll talk about in a second, um, are drawn from a single faction. Um, you know, other things like certain things become battle line and blah 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 um there are other things we could plot here in linear design battalions would fall up here um horde uh bonuses uh would fall into here would fall on the linear side because a horde bonus says if you take 10 uh free guild guard the logical choice for your next choice is to keep taking free guild guard until you hit the cap and then save money Okay, or points, whatever you want to say. In other words, that's a linear incentive structure. Because taking the normal small amount is less efficient than taking the maximum amount. Okay. Um, the old style and still some War Scrolls have this of like, if you have 20, if you have 30, then get XYZ. That's a linear side buff. Because again, same rules. Now, allies you would think I would put on the modular side. You, you think you, you look at this probably and you go, wait a minute, Vince. Allies allow you to take other best ofs. Shouldn't they be sitting on the modular side because they're allowing more freedom of open choice, not within, you know, not A then B? Hmm. I can see why you'd think that, but no, I actually place them very close to the middle on the linear side. And here's why. Because you have to think about the full consequences of the introduction of allies. Without allies, if there is some powerful piece I want, some hyper-efficient modular piece I want to include, without that ally exception, I have to choose to push myself into the modular side, away from my, I have to break, you know, my allegiance, I have to turn away from my faction synergies, and so on and so forth to take that thing. So if I'm in Stormcast and I want the Celestial Huracanum in a world without allies, I have to give up everything Stormcast, everything, to make that decision, okay? But once allies are introduced and you get this sort of exception area where I'm allowed to take the Huracanum, which nicely fits into the allies allotment in a 2,000-point army, then it actually frees me to be more linear because now I can stay completely linear with the rest of my army by the by without those allies once i take that huraconum and bust that stormcast allegiance and break all of that i immediately tumble down all the way into modular right because now all of a sudden well i'm not getting all those other benefits what other best ofs could i start taking and so i start falling but allies actually creates a floor that you don't go past sort of almost a bulwark against modular design, pushing toward linear, allowing you to stay in a linear design footing while still tweaking a little bit and dipping a toe in a modular choice. So it's second order consequences that it actually encourages linear design. In the same way, the Firestorm Allegiance abilities, even though they're Allegiance abilities, I actually place on the modular side because they are uh, extra bennies you get if your army is composed of a pretty wide amount of things. Uh, in other words, most of them have like six different factions or more in them, you know, that I can choose from to include units in. 
So they allow me there again, there it's very close. Both of these are very close to the middle line. That's why I actually quite like both of these design elements. And by the way, I, I kept the middle line just to sort of emphasize this, but we're not the goal of this is not to have every dot fall in that space. You can use hugely weighted linear items and hugely weighted modular items, but we're trying to make a point graph. The goal is when we draw the center line through all of these points, if I plotted every game element and then drew this, the mathematical mean, it should fall dead center on that green line. That's the perfect world we're trying to live in. Okay. Now, Firestorm Allegiance abilities say choose widely from all of this different stuff okay but it has to be from this broader group of stuff so again it's very close to that middle line but it it gives you some incentive where you can say well maybe i don't need all of that other faction stuff i could do a little more modular build and still fall back on some kind of allegiance ability now it's not as good as having the specific allegiance ability blah 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 of course right but it allows you to go more modular i could take the best of units from across six different um you know order factions and still get some kind of specific allegiance benny okay um it's a consolation prize perhaps but it sits on the whole on the modular side because, again, its second order consequence is that it actually allows and incentivizes a more modular based build to a point. Like I said, weekly, both of these are close to the middle. Again, why I like them so much. Down on the modular side are things like uh, Grand Alliance abilities, you know, where it's like be anything order and get this stuff. Well, most match play, match play itself says you can only choose from one Grand Alliance, so there's no actual additional restriction there. So that's just saying, choose anything, get this bonus. You paid no cost, hence it's the ultimate modular choice, right? Um, and finally, and perhaps most interestingly as a game element to me, overly efficient units. Uh, overly efficient units encourage modular design. The more, if you were to plot the power curve or efficiency curve, I should say, of every unit in the game, the more that fell way outside that mean line, the more modular the game is by its definition. Um, because the more you can collect the outliers into a single force and have that then be better than any synergistic combination of the, the stated game's intentional plans. Okay? So, to me, when I look at the Firestorm ones, I actually like, in a game design perspective, what they're doing because of how they incentivize the overall build structure. But on a deeper level, I want to see things continue to come out that encourage across this spectrum. Um, and it should be stated that there will always be some weight toward modular. Best of always has its own weight. At the same time, Linear has a gravity all its own, and that gravity is aesthetic unity, right? Like, we as human beings like it when things make sense together. Um, we like it when A, when, you know, A is followed by B is followed by C. If I, if I count, if, I, if, if you've ever heard anybody in uh, conversation begin a list and go A and then make their point and then go, and two, and your skin crawled, that's because human beings naturally don't like those sorts of uh, inconsistencies, right? We like things to fit together. And so we, we attract to the concept of armies naturally. There's, they have a gravity, a psychological pull. Whereas the modular pull is just toward the design of the game. The game's stated point is to win and to have fun while doing so. And overly efficient units are a pretty good way to achieve, let's call it one and a half of those things, okay? So there's already a unique tension between these two elements, uh, or these two themes, I should say. And our goal as designers should be to continue to reinforce both of these, to make sure that we're plotting and pulling in both directions and creating that healthy tension. So, summary. Uh, 
my summary would be this for age of sigmar to achieve sort of the maximum amount of fun for the maximum amount of people we need the game to be designed at a 45 degree angle and we should allow for these things that are released to see how they work and to see how they actually fit how they affect the meta we should play with them and see what their effect and and see how they start changing people's incentives and in design it's often hard to predict this stuff by the by even as a game designer um i've been doing this for almost 15 years now uh and since 2004 and the reality of it is it's very difficult to know all of your second and third order consequences so even the most experienced people don't always uh, understand exactly the impact, especially in large, complex systems, and there are fewer, larger, complexer systems than Warhammer. And I think what I want, and what we should all probably want, is to have the maximum amount of armies, forces, lists, whatever, that are interesting and viable. Again, viable, not, not tournament winning, or top of the list, or whatever. I don't, I don't care about any of that, and again, that's a different topic viable can be put together and can be relatively competitive that's the bar okay and by the by just as a final touch on balance a side effect of this type of design is enhanced balance it's not sufficient but it is necessary because balance becomes is an emergent property of a larger number of viable lists in the meta at any given point in time if every army, because of the mix of design, has multiple different lists designed and skewed towards multiple different things that are all viable but have interesting interactions, maybe some even being hard rock, scissors, paper with each other, that actually creates a pretty interesting meta. See most of Magic the Gathering's history at its healthy times when different types of play styles and different types of decks could rotate through and would change and push against each other and create sort of a uh, create a a healthy large balanced I just made finger air quotes meta okay all right so there you go that's my thoughts on linear versus modular design especially as it relates to allegiance abilities and sort of the most recent firestorm thing like I said kind of a response to myself I appreciate you watching as always it is greatly 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 appreciated uh don't forget to give it a like if you liked it subscribe for more hobby cheating and game theory and warhammer weekly and everything else we do here in the future and of course share this if you've got somebody else who's a little bit of a, a game design wonk or nerd like myself and you think they'd enjoy it that's always the nicest thing you can do but as always we'll see you next time